Now that the initial dust has settled and the IHL has explained a little bit more detail why it voted to fire uh, Chancellor Jones, do you still think the board made a, quote, egregious decision and a major mistake, as you said in your op-ed? I, I thought that was a mistake and for several reasons. Number one is that this university, over the last 20 years, has made such progress at the medical center and the Oxford campus uh, in all areas, teaching, research, outreach, service, every area. We've just been remarkable, really, almost a miracle. Uh, I thought the egregious work fit, word fit because Dr. Jones was undergoing chemotherapy while this conversation was going on. And I just have always believed that when someone is, someone is sick or down, that's not a good time to hit them with something really hard, life shattering. And so that might have been a better word, but egregious seemed appropriate to me and it still does. So cancer aside, was it a mistake of the IHL to fire Chancellor Dan Jones? Well, Neil, I wasn't in the room with the IHL. I don't know what went on in there. And, no, and Dr. Jones has not told me anything about those discussions. So I don't really know. I do know this, and, and, uh, and that is that those people who serve on the board, that, who served on the board the, the 12 years, four, 14 years I was chancellor, uh, took their work seriously. Uh, I never really had a conflict with them except over the funding per student, which I thought my first year was right on target because we were going down in enrollment. We were losing students. We lost 1,000 between 1994 and 1990. And so when I came in this job in 95, the first thing I did was put a great team together. And then we agreed on what we were going to do. And one of them was increase enrollment. Uh, and I don't want to give you a longer answer than you want, but I think that just has, this, this has to be said. A university's business is teaching, research, and service, but it is a business, and its revenue must exceed its expenses. If you're losing students, and tuition is a major part of your funding, then you've got to do something about that. Either the state has to increase its appropriation or you have to increase the number of students. And every year we read about requests for tuition increases. That's because the cost of operating a university goes up. So what I thought was we'd had 20 remarkable, well 19, my first year was a learning year, okay? So we had 19 remarkable years uh, here and at the medical center. It wasn't all perfect. We made some mistakes. But when I make a mistake, I'm very comfortable saying I made a mistake. And my agreement with the people who were on my management team had to promise me that if they disagreed with me, they'd tell me. And so I think that at the time this event occurred, I don't know how long it went on, but I do think that uh, the University of Mississippi and our medical center neither has ever been at the level, uh, never been perceived as, pos as so positively, not only locally and nationally, but internally. One of the challenges with the Mississippi organization is helping Mississippians get over this inferiority complex that we have about being poor, and about high illiteracy rates. And I could go on and on, but I can tell you don't want me to do that, so I'll stop. <laughs> well, I would like to come back one more time to uh, the decision by the IHL not to renew the, the Chancellor's contract. Mm -hmm. um, in your op-ed, you really rallied to uh, Chancellor Jones's defense, and you oh, said yeah. he's successful, enrollment is up, um, and you said there really isn't a need to replace him. Do you still feel that way? Well, again, I was not in that boardroom, so I don't know what the exchanges were between Dr. Jones and any one or among the group of board members. I don't know what went on there. Um, I do know that boards hire the university leaders, they oversee what they're doing, and they terminate them. And so what they did was fully within the power of the board. 
and I don't know how you accept this comment, uh, and I care what you think about what I say, but I really think it's a generous act for a person to serve on the board. You think about taking a person who has a full-time profession or job and asking them to meet either over the telephone over the telephone during the month or in person once a month and be able to really and truly understand what's happening on each campus. And most people don't know this, but when you combine the home campuses of the eight universities and the home campuses of the 15 community colleges, public, public, both, and their branches, we have 56, I think it's 56, physical installations where we offer higher education. Now we're a very small state. Every year you hear the community colleges and the universities in K through 12 begging for more money. So my thought for a long time has been, we need to run efficiently, operate efficiently, be streamlined. And I think a board of trustees made up of 12 people appointed by the governor can do that. But you do that in an advisory capacity, not in a managerial capacity. So I'm a member of a board of a Fortune 500 company. If I tried to tell the CEO how to run his business or her business, it would be a mistake. I, I, would, be in, I, I would be out of line. My job is to listen to what they and their professional support groups, auditors, uh, compensation specialist, human relations specialist, uh, to listen to what they say and then say, well, based on what we've heard, we think we ought to build a new building. Well, then let me ask you this. Since in your op-ed you uh, used very strong language, and I if did. I can quote this, you said, perhaps this evil deed, clearly motivated by personal and or political reasons and not on performance, will prompt someone in the leadership position to initiate a move to transform the current dysfunctional and wasteful IHL system. Then let's talk a little bit about this, because you said the current model is a failure, and again, this, these, these are your words. Would you clarify what you have in mind when you say transform the IHL system? Uh, Do you really mean that every university should have its own advisory board? No, I don't mean that at all. Um, I, I, could, I can see how a 12-member board, by having specific responsibilities, divided up among groups of four, three or four, could oversee the research universities, the non-research universities, uh, and if necessary, the medical center. But it would be one board. And uh, I actually threw that line in the article about 10 boards or whatever I said. Did I say 10? Did I use that number? You didn't. You did not use that I'm number. glad I didn't. But I would have just to stir the water. I, I won't. Well, you said each university have its own board, so I suppose that would be eight. Same thing. It'd be yeah. eight. Yeah. But so anyway, it just seems to me that our universities are begging for money from the legislature every year, raising tuition every year, duplicating what we do on multiple campuses, and by that I mean course offerings and degree opportunities. And I think a, a committee, a very well-organized committee of board members, university presidents, and perhaps the chancellor, the next chancellor, uh, members of a, of a faculty, probably a fairly large committee, uh, business people, economic development people, people from K through 12, from the community colleges, ought to come together. We did that um, as a state in, in, in something called Blueprint Mississippi. And it, excuse me, but it was a, it was a, a gathering of business and education and economic development people. And Haley Barber implemented Blueprint Mississippi. And we were glad he did, and we were glad he named it the Haley Barber Blueprint. We didn't care who got the credit for it. We just wanted it done. And what would you have this committee do? I'd have the committee look at the current system and say, okay, now we have four universities that are not research universities. Mm -hmm. So we don't want them spending money and resources on graduate level programs, except in exceptional cases. I'll give you one example. One of our universities, uh, let me back up. Every university was created by the legislature. 
by a statute. You can go to the Mississippi Code and you can read what the legislature intended for every university. Uh, and I'm not going to go into the, 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 anybody can look that up. It's public information. But uh, that committee could look at what the what the universities are actually doing. Are they staying true to the mission for which the legislature created them, or have they let their tentacles reach out into other areas that are expensive and detract from the primary mission? And I think that kind of review ought to take place at Ole Miss, at the medical center, at all the other universities. I don't. I mean, I think we should be carefully reviewed, and we ought to be operating as efficiently as we possibly can. Now, I need to add a sentence here. Uh, I'm not an accountant, so I knew when I became chancellor I was going to have to learn something about this budget. So I hired a recently retired Arthur Anderson partner who was an auditor and he came in and he spent about two months and then he wrote me a 36 page booklet on ways to deal with our financial shortfalls and our waste and our duplication and he said now this depends on whether you have the courage to change people don't like change you know they like progress but they don't like change very much so anyway uh, I said, I guarantee you, we're going to get something done about this because we're not going to keep losing students and we're not going to be a two-bit university. We're going to be a great university. And so the staff who worked with whom I worked made that commitment and we adopted a central value of respect for everything and everybody. And then we went about the business of revolutionizing how we spent our money. If, if I may, let, let me go back one more time to the current IHL model. So after you, after you've called them dysfunctional and wasteful, um, you you just said sort of have have members of the IHL board um, have in charge of different universities. But the, what you just talked about the advisory boards, what would be the function of the advisory? I don't mean the individual subcommittees to be in charge of the different universities, mm -hmm. but I do mean have special oversight and visit the campus and get to know the president or the chancellor or the particularly the CF, the, cha the chief financial officer, mm -hmm. and see where the money's being spent. Mm -hmm. I would invite any board member at any time, <coughs> excuse me, to come look, look at us. Mm -hmm. And if we're doing something that we ought not to be doing, for example, if we said, we're gonna start an agricultural program, they'll shoot me between the eyes because that's Mississippi State and Alcorn's responsibility, not the, the University of Mississippi is a liberal arts university that supports professional schools. Mm -hmm. now, I don't know much about the other schools, but I generally know what their missions are. And the question is, are, they, are we all being true to our missions? And if we're not, that means we're spending money on things we're not even, it's not illegal, mm -hmm. but it's not, it's not consistent with our charge our charge from the legislature and uh, we, we all you have to do is read the code to know why you were created and, and we were created in 1848 and we were created to be a center of learning that's what we were created for um when when we talk about possibly making these changes there are also changes underfoot several lawmakers have been very vocal and yeah. have said the IHL needs to be curbed, the REACH needs to be curbed. I think there's still a lot of outra outrage, um, and, and I know it's certainly in your opinion piece, you were outraged by the fact that here was a chancellor who by all measurable objectives was doing very, very well. Well, it certainly appeared that way. And, and then the, <coughs> the board, uh, with the help of some outside auditors, not internal auditors, but external auditors, independent firms, name national firms, uh, or state firms uh, who will look at your financials and your operations objectively and not biased in any way and they will give you honest answers and I you don't have time but I could give you the easiest example of all that I found in place that I didn't find Rex Deloach the auditor found uh, would you like to hear it? Well, I'll tell you what, I'd like to go back one more time to the, the, the state lawmakers. So here we have several state lawmakers who yeah. said, 
we need to change the way that the IHL operates. Yeah. Um, and they said, um, so for example, I'm thinking of um, uh, State Senator Gray Tollison, who was tweeting, sending a little picture uh, of the conference room at the Lyceum, which says IHL board, and says, we actually have a room here for our own board. Um, Miss Ole Miss should have its own board. Um, and really trying to avoid a step like this in the in the future where there is an IHL board that is somehow at loggerheads with a current chancellor who was doing appeared to be uh, who appeared to be doing partic uh, who appeared to be doing well um, do you think that kind of legislation that kind of change in legislation is something that's actually going to come about I really hope that the governor and the legislature will stay out of it the governor appoints four members for what is it nine year terms or ten year terms it changed mm -hmm. at, at one time it was for 12 years and it's not that much it's not that long anymore but governor uh, uh, governor Bryant will have an opportunity in May to appoint four new board members so the board's composition is going to change mm -hmm. now what I think should happen is that the board ought to initiate its own self-study have an independent committee a well-balanced, diverse committee that comes to the table uh, to talk about what is in place now and what can we do to be more efficient, have a better product, n know that a student will graduate with a degree that will enable that student to really live her or his full life to the fullest expectancy, fullest capabilities. I, I mean, I really, you look at me funny, but I really believe that. And I mean, do you know why I believe it? I saw it happen. I mean, this team did it at Ole Miss. That Honors College and that Croft Institute and the lot leadership and the racial reconciliation and the manufacturing excellence. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And I'm sure that on the other campuses, so those kinds of events have been, I'm, I'm not sure, I expect that on some of the other campuses, those kinds of events were happening. We went from a 10,000, I think the number is 10,181 students in 1995, to over 20,000 students now. We have more than 20,000 applications. I was told, I, didn't, I don't go on the campus. When I left the campus, I left the campus. This is the first time I've... Which is, which is why it is so unusual for you to wade into it, this. It is, it is. It, that's not... Typically, so you must have been really angry to do well, so. Well, I'm not angry. I, I so help me, I'm not angry. But you were. No, I really wasn't. I'm, anger is not healthy. Anger, you don't think clearly when you're angry. Okay. Um, I, I told you earlier that Benjamin Franklin said you ought to make your plans over candlelight and wine, but you ought to make your decisions in the morning when you're thinking clearly. So I wasn't mad uh, in, the, in, in an anger sense. Mm -hmm. I was upset about breaking this momentum that we have underway. Mm -hmm. And I, I really didn't know enough about what went on inside the boardroom with Dr. Jones and the board to know whether uh, it was the only decision they could make or the only decision he could make or not. But here's, this is how I view this today. Those decisions have been made for whatever reason, right or wrong or in the middle. Now, having been an athlete, I've been knocked down many times. And when you're knocked down, you either lie there and get run over, you go off the field, or you get back up and play. And so what I'm saying is I hope the board will think about a real self-study evaluation. And when they do a self-study, that would include the eight universities in the medical center and the board. How do we function? How much do we really know about Ole Miss? Are they feeding us a line of baloney every month when they report to us? Or are these numbers accurate? I mean, you, that has to be checked. I mean, you're president in another state who's, they're, they're just almost our size. Their average ACT went from 24 to 26 in the freshman class in two years. Well, that's not possible. You can't do that, okay? Mm -hmm. So what he told me was, well, we don't count anybody who makes less than 26. I said, what are you talking about? He said, we have, an, uh, we have a cohort of students in the freshman class whose ACT scores we don't measure. Well, that is not appropriate behavior. That is, I'm not going to call it dishonest, but that's not consistent with what 
our expectations of each other. We expect each other to level, tell the truth. Now, if I can go back to what you just said, you said if you, uh, as an athlete, if you were down on the field, um, you would. Uh, you said you can either get up or you get run over. That's right. If you had been in Chancellor Dan Jones's uh, position and you had been offered after these behind the closed door negotiations, you had been offered, uh, given this final offer of two more years extension, but no chance of a review, no chance of an extension, regardless of how he performed his duties as chancellor, what would your decision have been? Well, thank goodness I was never in that position. So I'm surely speculating, mm -hmm. but I think I would have done exactly what he did. I think I would have said, I can't be an effective chancellor if I am a lame duck. The, we're, we're, in, we're right on the verge of a major gifts campaign and we don't need to start that if, if the chancellor is not going to be there through all of it. Because the chancellor, although other people do a lot of contacting of people for perspective for gifts, the chancellor has to be out front on that. So I think Dr. Jones probably made the only decision he could make. And perhaps the board made the only decision they could agree on. I wouldn't have made that decision. I, I mean, I respectfully disagree with the decision the board made. Whatever problems they may or may not have found at the medical center could have been dealt with. We dealt with them here in the 50, late and early middle 90s. We dealt with them at the medical center between 95 and when Dan Jones became chancellor. And things changed dramatically. And of course, you brought him, you brought yeah, him on I board. Did. Yeah, I did. I did. As but, the vice but chancellor, yeah. I do want to clear up something. I did not anoint him to be chancellor. That's just not true. And I put that in that article, I think. Right. That's not what wouldn't you be. I was asked by more than one person, do you th including Dan, do you think he can do the job as chancellor? I said, I, based on what I've seen at the medical center, absolutely. Because he seems to operate the same way we're operating, and we are making hay while the sun is shining. And we were and are today. This very I, I just want to make sure that, that we don't leave an impression that maybe you don't want to give. You said, it, suddenly you said, he appears to be doing well. I, you're not trying to suggest that you suddenly have doubt in Chancellor Jones' leadership function, correct? No, not any, not any doubts about his leadership up until this controversy erupted and became public information. Mm -hmm. I didn't know about it until I heard about it, mm -hmm. and not from him. Mm -hmm and not from a board member. I've talked to two board members in the last two weeks, both of whom initiated contact with me, okay? Because I, was, I, was, I wasn't friend, friend friends with everybody on the board, but some of my, those people on that board are friends of mine. I mean, Ed, Ed Blakesley and I have been fishing together, and we're gonna go again. That friendship's gonna continue, and as far as I'm concerned, this, this situation has been settled. Now let's get forward. Let's put a great search team together. Let's find a chancellor who's younger. She can be, or he can be, 45 or 50 maybe, 55. I was 56 when I became chancellor. But that person needs to be smart, have some experience with higher ed, uh, be charismatic, and have very thick skin. Last question I want to ask you. You touched a moment ago on, you said, we had great momentum here at Ole Miss, and we were just at the start of a, ma at a major of a major gift giving campaign. That's right. I assume you're referring to the promised twenty million that uh, Anthony Papa. I'm not referring to oh, that. You're going to refer to that, but, but that's part of it. That's part of it, right? Yeah. So Anthony, Anthony Papa, of course, through the Gertrude Ford Foundation, that's right. had said we will give the university twenty million to build a science building that's right. with Dan Jones at the helm. Yeah. Are you worried that through this whole controversy now? that gifts can dry up. Is that, is that what happens historically when there is a change at a helm, especially after so much turmoil? Well, when we changed in 95, we changed direction on gifts, on enrollment, on faculty morale, and on performance, and on new programming. And we cut out things that were wasteful. We just cut them out. Got rid of things that were not being helpful to us, and morale on our campus went up. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think Dan Jones is a man of integrity. Uh, he has good judgment. He's a lot quieter than I am, thank the Lord. Uh, but 
everybody has a different style. I think that between now and September 14th, which is the final date of his contract, he told me uh, that Dan will do the very best he can do as chancellor. But now anybody who's interested knows that that's going to be the end of it for him. And he knows it, the board knows it, the faculty knows it, the students know it. They don't think about it much. Sometimes they don't know who the chancellor is, by the way, which is fine. Uh, staff knows it, alumni know it. So what I hope will happen is that this, this uh, trauma will translate into an increase in momentum rather than, uh, well, let's give up and quit and go on off the field. I'd rather get back up and play. Thank you so much, Chancellor, for this interview. Thank you.